Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and establishing true democracy. Our guest today is Paul Cienfuegos, Program Director and Lead Trainer of Community Rights U.S. So welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks, David. It's always yeah. a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you have been here uh, several times before, yep. although not this year, when you know, because we just restarted the program at the beginning of the year. So, uh, so uh, glad glad you're here. Uh, talk first about community rights, the whole concept of community rights. What does that mean? So it's a movement that is barely still known um, west of the Mississippi, but it's coming to the West Coast in a big way. Um, it started in 1999, and there are now 200 communities in nine states across the U.S., mostly eastern half of the U.S., where uh, those city, counc city councils or county supervisors or county commissions have passed um, these fascinating, a new paradigm kind of law called a community rights ordinance or law that does three pretty amazing things. It strips uh, corporations of all of their constitutional rights at the local level. It bans specific harmful corporate activities that are normal and regulated corporate activities that the state and federal government regulate. Uh, and it enshrines into local law the inherent right of a community to govern itself, regardless of what the state and federal government say. That we, the people, have the inherent authority to protect our health and welfare at the local level, even when these so-called structures of law at the state and federal level tell us we can't. So it's a movement of communities taking their power back to protect their own health and welfare uh, against these illegitimate structures of law that violate our rights. Okay, and, and these inherent rights that we have to protect our health and welfare, are those inherent in the Constitution? Is that where a local community I'm not sure how to phrase that. Is that where a local community goes to justify what they're doing? Well, we say that the, fe that the preamble to the federal constitution and the first few paragraphs of the state constitutions and the Declaration of Independence all recognize these inherent rights, but we don't make the claim that we get them because they're on paper in those documents. It's because we, we are because people we are and the we people have the rights. And we have an inherent right of self-government yeah. and a okay. right to protect our health and welfare. But our constitutions, which are written in theory by us, both at by the, the federal level, class. right, uh, by bo at both the federal and the state levels, do recognize these rights. They do, um, and they're minimized as much as possible each time that there's a rewrite of state or federal constitutional mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. But you find in every state constitution, in the first few paragraphs, this tiny little remnant of the American Revolution. So, for example, our state constitution in Oregon begins, it's literally the first paragraph. Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 1, Natural Rights Inherent in People, we declare that all power is inherent in the people, and, and all free governments are founded on their authority, and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness, and they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. So in other words, if you don't have consent of the governed, at local, state, or federal level, you don't have government that's legitimate mm -hmm. in, a, in a constitutional republic. And therefore, the people have the authority to alter, reform, or abolish the government if, okay. that, if that happens. Okay. And that's and, the argument we're making. Okay, and, and they could do that at the state level, but most of this movement has been at the local county or city level? That's right. We start there, but we do, we in, in the states where there's already an active community rights movement, like Colorado and five other states, including Oregon, um, what happens is that the locals that have already passed these ordinances push their, uh, their political power up to the state by creating state community rights networks that start taking on illegitimate structures of law that violate our rights in the state constitutions and state corporate codes. And then the same thing happens later on in the movement at the federal level, where we're going to ultimately challenge the legitimacy of our federal constitutional structures that, like, I mean, the U.S. Constitution is basically a property rights document. Yes. Right? It's not really about rights. You know, the public was so incensed when the so-called founding fathers wrote the 
current constitution that they demanded a bill of rights to be added on because there was nothing about rights in it. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what what does the constitution say then? What in the constitution? Oh, it's in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. Uh -huh. okay. It's the only language that actually says consent to the governed that talks about mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So t talk about the rest of the Constitution. Why would you say that that's a, a property rights uh, document? Well, because um, the, what most people don't know is that it's our second U.S. Constitution and that our first Constitution that came right out of the American Revolution was a decentralized power constitution. It, the local and the state had authority and the federal had very little authority. So that power was, was at the state. It was strong state, weak federal. And those among the founding fathers like Madison uh, and, and Washington and others were so uh, uncomfortable with a truly revolutionary constitution that created real democracy at the local level, they wanted to replicate empire. That mm -hmm. was really their agenda. Um, they were among the, the richest and most powerful people in the country at the time. George Washington was the richest guy in the country when he became president, number one richest guy. Oh. Mm -hmm. And they actually wanted to create another Britain, another British empire in the New World with all these incredible resources, yeah. right? Why not? Well, just, so, just without the British. Exactly. Right, uh, and so um, the first constitution was thrown out unconstitutionally. There was a political coup just a decade into the existence of our first constitution, which is called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. It was intended to be our long-term constitution, but because of these empire-building fa founding fathers, they threw it out in an unconstitutional way uh, in the Philadelphia Convention, replaced it with a brand new second constitution. And so we went from uh, having no court, no standing courts and no Supreme Court, to having courts that overruled legislators. Mm -hmm. We went from having no executive branch to having an executive branch with veto authority. And we went from just having a, a Congress which was a Congress of the, of the states assembled to having a Senate which was appointed by the 1%. Uh -huh. So we ended up with a, with a strong federal elite rule system mm -hmm. with no rights at the local level. Right, okay, so, yeah. and, and with, the, with the purpose of protecting the property rights of those who wrote the Constitution. Exactly, right. yeah, I mean if you read the Constitution and not the amendments that were added years later, a couple years later, um, there's literally nothing about rights for people mm -hmm. in the entire document. Mm -hmm. oh, right, okay, yeah. And then, of course, we have added to those amendments uh, to hopefully further uh, the power of the people. Uh, in most cases, you know, uh, ending slavery, mm -hmm. uh, giving women the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still not full personhood. But still not full personhood. Women have never won full personhood uh, in the United that's right. States. Yeah, and, and, and we don't have... And corporations have. have. Yeah, yeah, and we don't have a federal right to vote. That's right. right. Yeah, which is, uh, <laughs> which a, is a serious oversight. Yeah. Uh, not oversight, it's yeah. on purpose, I right. would say. <laughs> Whatever, it's right. not yeah. there. Yeah, so uh, you went through the three things, the three major tenets, foundations of community rights. Uh, Give us an example of an ordinance, just one, somewhere. Sure. Well, I'm you know, I'm thrilled Oregon. to, not in Oregon? Not in Oregon. Okay. Right, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> we'll uh, get to that. Yeah, so uh, Grant Township, Pennsylvania um, is one of the most si exciting things happening in the country in our movement right now. A couple of years ago, they banned the dumping of frack water waste in their township. There wasn't fracking there, but they wanted to dump the wastewater there. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Energy Company wanted to do that. They banned it through a community rights ordinance. They were immediately sued by the energy company that claimed that because they weren't home rule, they didn't have the authority to do that. So the township supervisors then rapidly became home rule and passed the ordinance again. Uh -huh. um, there's And in addition to that, they gave the Little Mahoning River and Watershed rights of nature in the new Home Rule Amendment that they passed. And so that gave the Little Mahoning Watershed the legal right to appear in the courtroom. So nature appears as a legally right, rights-based entity in the courtroom, countersuing the Pennsylvania Energy Company. Mm -hmm. And this court case is now playing itself out 
in Pennsylvania. That's one of the most exciting things that's happening in our okay. movement today. And that's, that's happening right now. Right now. Okay, right, yeah. yeah. So it, go they were the first, mm -hmm. um, it was the first time that, that uh, a natural body had legal standing to appear as, a per in a, as if they were a person in a court of law mm -hmm. in the United okay. States. Yeah, so how does that, how does that actually <coughs> happen? How does, how does a river represent itself? Yeah, I wish I knew exactly <laughs> how that works. I mean, obviously there must be a human being in the courtroom representing this, yes. this rights-based entity. Uh -huh. But I don't know the specifics. Okay, all right, yeah. Right. yeah. And, and, and as you know, this uh, movement of establishing the rights of nature is actually a worldwide movement that's going on. It is, and yet, believe it or not, it started in Pennsylvania. So when Ecuador uh, passed its new constitution more than a decade ago um, that gave, that recognized rights of nature in the constitution, first time in world history, a lot of the uh, support that they got was from farmers in rural Pennsylvania that had done this a number of years earlier. Mm -hmm. It actually, the, the whole international rights of nature movement at least this kind of language for the legal, the legal structure, comes from Pennsylvania. Amazingly yeah. enough, mm -hmm. from conservative rural farm communities. Conservative rural farm communities, right? That's yeah. not what we usually think no. of. No, they were assisting Ecuadorian parliamentarians. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so I know uh, that there are things going on in Oregon right now. So. I know you really want to talk about that, so yeah. let's do that. Okay. <laughs> so what's what's happening? So in you know Oregon? this movement has been going since 1999. There are 200 communities in nine states that have already passed these groundbreaking ordinances. But Oregon has been. We have like six or eight active counties in Oregon that have been trying to pass ordinances for the last three or four years, um, all through the ballot box and all unsuccessful until this one. Um, uh, Lane and Benton County tried to pass bans on GMO agriculture through the ballot box and lost a few years ago. Um, there have been a few other attempted ones that lost. But in, uh, in May of this year, during our primary election day, in Lincoln County, which is Newport uh, and other communities on the Oregon coast, by a 61 vote margin, um, they passed a, uh, it's called the Freedom from Aerially Sprayed Pesticides of Lincoln County. It's the first ever ban through the ballot box of aerially pay sprayed pesticides mm -hmm. um, in the United States. Okay. It's a, so we call these rights-based bans, uh, and basically, and it's uh, it's uh, absolutely amazing that this thing passed because um, first, the entire board of supervisors of the county very actively campaigned against it. The entire Newport City Council actively campaigned against it. And, and this was at the ballot, so... This was a ballot box. So the citizens of Lincoln County yes. uh, did pass it in spite of uh, the active... It was 6,994 to 6,933. Raise your It passed by okay. 61 votes after a recount. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Right. So you had all of the officials lining up against it? Against it. What were their arguments well, against it? Well, it? it's always the same thing. It's we're going to be sued and we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And so what's really fascinating about um, the movement in general is that these 200 communities in nine states that have already passed these, mm -hmm. either the elected officials or the, or the voters in those communities have finally reached the point where they've had enough of corporations being allowed to harm them legally right, that, that harm caused by corporations is so background normal these days that, be, and it's, it is because the structures of law do not permit a local government to ban these harmful corporate activities mm -hmm. because they, is the legal claim is it violates a corporation's constitutional rights, which is this like crazy 198 year history that the Supreme Court has granted us, and it violates state preemption and other laws and so our claim is, well, those aren't legitimate because they violate consent of the governed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't follow it either. Let's see. <laughs> sorry. Darn. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably find it okay. again. We were, so we were talking about what had happened ah, in Lincoln I got County. It. Okay, I got great. It. Okay, good. So these 200 communities have gotten to the point where the culture shift is significant enough oh, yes. that they understand that it's, that it's worth the lawsuit. These are 200 communities, residents and electeds, that are now less afraid of a lawsuit from a corporation than they are of losing the health, safety, and welfare of the community mm -hmm. and the local nature. 
right? So that's part of the culture shift that we're always talking about is we have to lose our fear of lawsuits, yes. right? Because for us to protect our health and welfare and the local level, it's, it's inevitable that some of our communities are gonna be sued because it's currently illegal to pass a ban on corporate activities in our community. Mm -hmm. And that has to change. If we're gonna claim we live in a democratic republic, we have to change those structures of law because they're violating our rights. And so that's what this movement is. We have to get past this mm -hmm. freaking out about lawsuits. Okay, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, so uh, this is happening in Tillamook County. It was passed at Lincoln the- Lincoln County. Or Lincoln County, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah. this, this was passed in Lincoln County. At what stage is it now? So let me explain basically what it does real quick. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So the right of local community self-governance gives Lincoln County voters the right to create and pass local laws mm -hmm that protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people from commu their community and nature. It also empowers them to enact laws that ban corporations from engaging in activities that violate the above rights and obligates county government for enforcement. It's known as the Freedom from Airly Sprayed Pesticides Ordinance of Lincoln County. It secures the rights of people to be free from toxic trespass, the right to clean air, water, and soil, and the right to enjoy outdoor recreation, all free from the harm of aerially sprayed pesticides. In addition, the rights of ecosystems and natural communities in Lincoln County are also protected from the aerial spraying of pesticides. Um, and the argument is that, the, that we have a constitutional right of local self-government, which takes precedence over that of state preemption when such laws are less protective of health and safety. Right? So okay. the state mm -hmm. doesn't guarantee our health and safety from aerially sprayed pesticides. And it, there is a lot of pr legal precedence that a community government has the authority to protect health, safety, and welfare. Yeah. And that's Especially all we're claiming. Especially when the state is not doing it. it right, because right. again, yeah. there's no consent to the governed. Mm -hmm. um, so almost immediately after it was passed in May, mm -hmm. there was a lawsuit uh, um, expected. Expected <laughs> from uh, one of my favorite and probably one of your favorite um, phony grassroots organizations, Oregonians for Food and Shelter, mm -hmm. which sounds like a nice grassroots organization, but Love is it. actually made up Warm of, fuzzy. of uh, logging corporations and um, pesticide corporations. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what else, maybe some agricultural corporations mm -hmm. thrown in. Um, and they're suing. Um, is among them. So I'll just read this because I had yeah. such tiny print. This election was the first major hurdle. Mm -hmm. Had to over. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So what the what the lawsuit is claiming um, is that the state and corporations have superior rights that give them the authority to override the rights of the people, including the people's right to vote and their constitutional right to safety. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's and and you know it's it's worth saying briefly that the way that the, we write these ordinances, unlike conventional environmental lawmaking, is we write them so that the corporation is forced in the courtroom to make the legal arguments that we need them and want them to make. Mm -hmm. So the corporate lawyers are forced to make a, an argument that the the constitutional rights of the people of Lincoln County are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and that the constitutional rights of the corporation that wants to poison the residents, those constitutional rights trump the rights of actual human beings. Okay. They're forced to do that. They're forced to make other legal arguments simply to get at the ban. It's kind of like the ordinance is written like an onion and the ban is in the center and then it's wrapped in these new legal claims. And the legal claims have to all be challenged one at a time in the courtroom by a corporate attorney. Yeah. So they're a, on our legal playing field, yeah. and that's what's exciting. That's a, that's a brilliant strategy. That really is, right. And this it's is exciting. the strategy that has been used elsewhere? Yes, this right. has been the strategy for, mm -hmm. for most of the last 17 years oh, right. that okay. this movement has been active. Right. Yeah. yeah. Have uh, communities lost in court? So of the 200 communities that have passed these across the U.S., about 5% have been legally challenged, which is amazing success record. Uh -huh. So about 190 so successfully banned mm -hmm. something that was imminent, and then it never came. So that's a huge, I mean, that's a way better success record than most conventional yeah. environmental lawmaking. Mm 
um, the 5% or approximately 10 communities that were sued, what happened in most of those cases is that the city or county government got scared, which is, again, culturally what we're trying to avoid. They got scared, and so they went into closed session, and they took the law off the books in response to the threat of a lawsuit, sometimes not even an actual lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And poof, the law is now gone, which mm -hmm. is really, again, a violation of the trust of the people that they represent, of their constituents. Yeah. So in very few of these cases have we actually lost a court case yet. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Grant Township is going to play out however it plays out. But I should say that it's not that we're expecting to win in the courts, because for a judge to side with us would be for them to ignore what's, what is claimed to be settled law, mm -hmm. 100 years, 200 years of it's settled that corporations have constitutional rights. It's supposedly settled that the state has the authority to preempt the local. But we're challenging all of these as a violation of consent to the governed. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is there any place else in Oregon where this uh, strategy is, is uh, being used? or? Um, well, there, there are current campaigns. Unfortunately, uh, Columbia County got as far as collecting signatures, which is one county downriver from, from here, from Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and they collected about half the signatures they needed and ran out of steam. And so unfortunately, oh. they have just in the last week or two uh, put their ordinance uh, campaign on a shelf, which oh. is really sad for it's me sad. As, a, mm -hmm. s as a community rights organizer. Yeah. And what was it that they were doing? Um, their their uh, ordinance was a ban on fossil fuel uh, trains, on oil trains specifically, coming through Columbia County to an export terminal that's being uh, constructed in Klatskanai, near Klatskanai in their county. So it would have banned oil trains and export fossil fuel terminals mm -hmm. in the county. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. And the price of oil collapsed so a while ago, and the train stopped coming oh. because the oil that they were carrying is no longer, a, a, there's no money, there's no profit to be getting that kind of oil to ship to China right now. Mm -hmm. And so the public ended up concluding that the problem had already been solved. Oh, right. But again, it's just about the current price of mm -hmm. oil, and yeah. then the trains will start again. That's too bad. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In Lane County, um, they're following suit. Lane County is Eugene and Springfield, um, and it's kind of exciting what's happening there. Lane County is following the lead of Lincoln County. Um, they are currently already collecting signatures for two initiatives simultaneously. One would ban aerial spraying of, of herbicides, like Lincoln's, mm -hmm. and the other would recognize a community's um, right of, of self-government. Um, and I haven't actually seen that second one. Um, I just found out about it recently. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, I'd be interested to But that's to interesting. That. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's Lane County. So uh -huh. they hope to be on the ballot during our primary election ne next May. Oh, in, in May. Okay. In Lane County with mm -hmm. two initiatives. Okay. All right. So you have a new organization that you're starting, yes. so talk about that. So we're just a few weeks from launching Community Rights US, and our website's communityrights.us rather than .org. Um, Community Rights US is going to be a national support organization for the community rights movement, um, and we're gonna be helping communities all over the United States through direct workshops in their communities, through ongoing webinars. We've created a, we have a four-person staff, um, and, um, I just went blank again. We've created a, a resource network that can be seen on our website at communityrights.us of people and organizations that are gonna, basically their role is gonna be to help. Uh, so you're, you're, a, you're a, a member of a local community and you're wanting to stop clear cut logging or you're wanting to stop the latest big box store, or you're wanting to stop a fracking operation or an oil pipeline. So what, who do, what do you do right now? Normally, what you do is you call a state regulatory agency mm -hmm. and you ask for help. That has historically been all that you know how to do. But our goal is instead there's going to be an organization that can immediately help you bypass pleading with regulatory agency directors because they're just really designed to approve uh, corporate proposals, not mm -hmm. prohibit them, mm -hmm. to regulate them, to, to normalize them. Uh, well, it's really regulating us. Which really is, right. exactly. <laughs> right. It regulates yeah, yeah. our activity, our, mm -hmm. our activism. Um, and so what we're doing is uh, creating a national support organization, which will be the second one to be established in the United States, that can give you all the services you need from an initial training, which I do, and which I'll be training other people to do early next year. 
uh, all the way through to how do you do internal decision making so you're a functional organization, mm -hmm. what we call collaborative governance. Um, how do you deal with conflict resolution internally in your working group, because these are multi-year campaigns. Um, organizing 101 trainings, um, so all the aspects of, of doing functional community organizing at the grassroots level. And the piece that we're adding to the existing uh, community rights movements work that we're incredibly excited about is the culture shift work. We're in the process of forming a brand new weekend training called Becoming We the People. Mm -hmm. And that's about how do we, a after we learn that We the People actually, in my weekend initial training, um, which is about the, the first steps in, in dismantling these structures of law, how do we then internalize an understanding that we are we the people and that that means that government and business institutions are required to serve us as our subordinates. Mm -hmm. That literally is the constitutional reality, even though it doesn't feel like that, of course, yep. in our bodies. Yep. And how do we get from begging government and corporate institutions to instructing government and corporate institutions mm -hmm. as the sovereign? Mm -hmm. And what does that shift feel like in our bodies? Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, powerful work that you're going to be doing. So we have we have a, about uh, thirty seconds left. Oh uh, so, so t t tell us again what the, what's the name of the group and what's the website? Community Rights US or Community Rights mm -hmm. We're launching with a thirty day online fundraising campaign in just a couple of weeks. So um, you've got the, our contact info on the screen. Uh -huh. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love you to donate. We're trying to raise $60,000 starting in late September on an Indiegogo website. Okay, all right, excellent. Thank you so much for being here, Paul. Pleasure as always. All right, very good, thank you. All right. So we've been talking with Paul C. and Fuegos, Program Director and Lead Trainer with uh, Community Rights US, a community rights organization in the United States, but loca located right here in Portland, Oregon. If you would like to learn more about the Community Rights Movement or to donate to Community Rights U.S., please visit their website at www.communityrights.us. They are a nonprofit. While there, also sign up for their newsletter. Have you missed one of our programs? Want to watch something again or suggest a, a friend watch something? Well, you can do that now as all our programs are saved on our webpage. Visit www populistdialogues.org to view past programs or when viewing a program to sign up for our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel and receive a notification when a new program is added. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.